Well, uh, good morning everyone. It's uh, June 14, 2014. A wonderful day for me as a parent. My oldest daughter, the oldest daughter of six. I have six daughters. Her birthday today, I won't tell you what her age is. <laughs> this is Dr. Gabriel Iris. Good to be with you. Today I'd like to talk to you talk with you about a momentous uh, experience that uh, I lived through when I was uh, at the tender age of 19, 20, around there. It was, my friends, the day that I was sentenced to death by firing squad. You heard right. I was sentenced to death. By firing, by firing squad and it was frankly one of the most memorable if not one of the best things that ever happened to me I was of course drafted against my will like all the other young uh, South African citizens into South Africa's uh, apartheid defense force where I took a stand as a non-combatant and of course I stuck out like a sore thumb and was mistreated at every turn, court-martialed for being a non-combatant and was sent unarmed to the war zone in the foreign country, Namibia. Believe it or not, I actually vol volunteered for that. I preferred that uh, to be out in the desert, uh, in nature, rather than being stuck uh, in a desk uh, in the city, in a concrete city, Johannesburg, that would have been my sentence for two years uh, and what I was entitled to as a non-combatant. No, I volunteered to go to the war zone, to go to Namibia, nature. I love nature. I come alive in nature. There, of course, at times I was even denied food and water by my own officers, ridiculed and mocked at every turn as a non-combatant, and yet I hold the distinction of being a four-year war veteran on the borders of South Africa, all of it unarmed. I never once violated my non-combatant code, even though they decided one day to shoot me by firing squad in the desert of Avamba land in Namibia. The story opens in the sands of Avamba land at a place called Oshikati, Oshiwelo, Oshikati, in the vast recesses of the then Southwest Africa, now Namibia. The year was 1976, and the circumstances were that I was part of a battalion of South Africans, as I say, then embroiled in the vicious and sad and insane conflict between South Africa and uh, SWAPO, the acronym for South West African People's Organization. Yeah, right, since they took over, they ruined the country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. But that's another story. So as I say, although I was a soldier in uniform, I was a conscientious objector. In other words, this was a classic conflict where I stood for life and for freedom and yet the armed forces of whom I was forced to be a part stood for something else insanity hatred the annihilation of life the enslavement of innocent fellow human beings consequently I found myself in the middle of a war without a rifle without a gun without a pistol totally unarmed. Well, what then? Had I actually gone mad? What was I doing there? Well, as I say, I was drafted in the army. I had no choice. But that did not mean, my friends, that the army would force its will on me, even though I was only 19. I, in my heart, stood for something. And the army and me were about to find out whether I was a fake 
or whether I really believed what I stood for and was willing to face the consequences, even death by firing squad. I'll never forget that day. It was about 11 in the morning. I was going about my duties as a medic. And uh, for all intents and purposes, I looked like any of the dozens of the other soldiers going about their duties with one glaring exception. An exception that this believing eyes of my regimental sergeant major immediately discerned as I walked past him. Hey, you! He roared using his most aggressive, stentorian, and intimidating voice. Come here! Every head turned to face him. Everyone was terrified of this guy. He's like six feet four, and I'm like five feet seven. <laughs> David and Goliath situation. <laughs> you! He yelled out, unmistakably pointing to me. Now, I must tell you, my friends, I don't scare easily. But this giant of a man had my attention. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Fear <laughs> reared its ugly head within me. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> yes sir, I said. Rather nervously as I stepped up to him, saluted and stood at attention, waiting like a lamb to the slaughter for my fate. By this time, a crowd of soldiers had crowded around us to watch the spectacle, and I was beginning to feel, as I say, like the proverbial lamb being led to the slaughter. Where's your rifle, soldier? He boomed out. I don't have one, sir, I replied. Why not? He began to say. Never mind. Go and get a rifle right now before I lose my temper and never let me see you without it again. I cannot do that, sir, I calmly replied. I'm a conscientious objector. It's against my conscience. I'm a non-combatant. What? He roared. Listen here, you moron. We're in a war zone. And no one under my command will walk around the norm. Do you hear me? No one. Now, I am going to tell you once more to go and get a rifle or else I will have you shot by firing squad. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Sir, I replied. <laughs> Butterflies go running amok in my stomach. <clears throat> you may go ahead and shoot me, but I will not compromise my convictions or what I stand for. Right, he yells, you asked for it. This afternoon, when the Commandant gets back at 4 o'clock, I am going to shoot you. Sadly, I have to have his permission first. So in preparation, buddy, go and get yourself two pieces of wood, make a cross, and write your name on it. Because I will shoot you, and we will bury you, right here where you stand, in the desert of this foreign country. Do you hear me? Now get out of my sight! I turned and walked away feeling numb from head to toe. <coughs> Excuse me. My friends, I'm uh, 59 years old now. I've had some severe tests in my life, but this one, for obvious reasons, stands out in my memory. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, I am stubborn. I had taken a stand for my convictions, from my heart. I wasn't being clever, I wasn't trying to be rebellious. And not even the threat of death was going to dissuade me. I believed I was bigger than the life I was living. The question is, my friends, would I pass the test today? No. My convictions, of course, were tested severely here. But you know, we all get tested, and sometimes the little tests we give in to lead to bigger and bigger problems. For example, a drug addict who dies of an overdose starts small, and the dose gets bigger and bigger until it destroys his life. You see, I knew that back then. At the tender age of 19, I knew that. 
I began reading already wonderful books like Man of Steel and Velvet, A uh, Man of Steel and Velvet. I'm sorry, by Professor Andelin, uh, and his wife also wrote a beautiful book on uh, how to be uh, a real feminine woman. Uh, I read uh, books like Letters to Philip. And I expanded my world, even though I was so young. I knew that, hey, something is going on here. We're not just this flesh and blood, these bones, these muscles, these uh, cells, this DNA. So, you know, my stance is never to compromise on the important things, the things we stand for, my friends. The truth, in other words. can't compromise the truth. Never. But to stand fast, like an immovable mountain, like a rock of Gibraltar. And I'm telling you now, even though they may kill us, they may shoot us, and sometimes they do, we will prevail. We are bigger than the lives we live. I have, of course, borne the wrath and consequences of taking stances <laughs> all my life. Horrible wrath and horrible consequences. I ever the alternative, living a life which places our indomitable human spirit in servitude, clothed in cowardice, is absolutely intolerable and unimaginable to me. No way. No way will I submit to being a slave, to being such a coward. I'd rather take a bullet, I exit the earth land. You see, society around us is extremely well designed and on purpose to put unbelievable pressure on us to conform, to be sheeple instead of people. <laughs> okay? So when we take a stand for something we believe in and society does not agree or is irritated by it, people around us begin to put tremendous pressure on us to bend, to abandon our convictions and to conform. After all, who the hell do we think we are? Say, for example, we decide to homeschool our kids, which my wife and I did for seven wonderful years. Say we decide to quit an oppressive job where we were doing okay and start a project we've been wanting to start for a long time, a project we're absolutely in love with, a project which sets our hearts on fire, brings us to life, a project which makes us feel glad to be alive. And we can't wait to jump out of bed in the morning to continue with our work. But what happens? The prophets of doom and gloom become legion suddenly. <laughs> they start berating us for leaving a well-paid job. They berate us for wanting to homeschool our children. Just who do we think we are anyway? Why don't we just hunker down and be like everyone else? You're not special. Is the intonement, is there a chant? You're just like everybody else. Don't you realize that? Wake up, you idiot. <laughs> why? I'll tell you why, my friends, because everyone else is miserable. Everyone else is everyone else. They are not us. We did not come to this earth plane to be like everybody else. We came, as the proverb says, with a unique song in our hearts. Okay? And if we don't sing that song, it will be a very, very sad outcome for our lives. See,
everyone else, the proverbial everyone else, cannot possibly understand what is in our hearts, what is driving us to do what we want to do. The infinite, the creative intelligence, God, whatever you want to call that power, that force, put within us, uh, nay, you know, he inscribed deep in our genes what we were meant to do on this planet. He didn't just put it in, he inscribed it deep in our DNA. But because we're all different and unique, no two of us have exactly the same goal. No two of us ever sings exactly the same song, exactly the same way. No two of us sees the world the same way. Oh, we have similarities in views, of course, but no two of us ever see things exactly the same way. <coughs> that being the case, my friends, how can we expect another to understand what we're doing? What we have to do as prescribed by the infinite, the creative intelligence. So let us not be daunted by the fact that others do not understand us and do not approve of what we're doing. They cannot understand us. They are not us. I, and I'm sure you, have wrestled with this quandary many times, if not every day. We want to do something different, but we're scared. We're terrified. We're apprehensive. What if it doesn't work out and everyone ends, everyone ends up laughing at us? <coughs> What if it ends up costing us dearly financially? And on and on the gloomy considerations go. Hey, and I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Of course it does. But it doesn't mean it has to continue happening. It doesn't mean it has to happen to you. Not even once. If you know how, you can actually avoid negativity in your life. You can actually Train yourself, train your mind that negativity in any form, size or shape does not touch you. Yeah. Read you, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. You'll see what I mean. And many other books. All the sages from time immemorial have taught that and still being taught to this day. So, going back to my point, to solve our conscience we go to our mates, relatives, friends, bosses, etc. and we tell them our plan and we watch their faces for a reaction, holding our breath as we wait. Will they see what we do? Will they agree? Will they give us their blessing? Often, so often we're so disappointed though. They kill our idea absolutely decimated. <laughs> they do not see things as we see them. They can't. The infinite did not put the programming within them that the infinite put within us. And so our, our idea withers. It dies an unnatural death like a rosebud that never saw and felt the warmth of the sun. And you know what happens next? A little more of us dies. That's right. A little more of what the infinite put within us dies. But that's not all. A little more of God dies within us as well. Yeah. <coughs> but the great spirit, the infinite, intended that we water our, our idea, that we water it, that we nurture it, that we fertilize it, and that we let it feel the warmth of the sun so that it can blossom and bloom like a beautiful rose. I ask each and every one of us, what are we going to do with this realization? Are we going to determine as much as is humanly possible to accept each other as God made us? 
and allow and support each other to nurture our dreams until they blossom and bloom? Or are we going to squelch one another and crush one another until what is left of us is an empty and hollow shell? Drab and insipid, colorless and dead, good only for the grave? Okay. Back to my story now. In the desert, I was sentenced to death by firing squad. The commandant arrived, <laughs> duly, four o'clock, and explained to my reg regimental sergeant major that he couldn't shoot me. It was my legal right to take the stand I had taken. Well, my friends, hell hath no fury, goes the saying. <laughs> as a regimental soldier major losing face like that. Wow. The man persecuted me, my friends, at every chance he got. But you know what? I did my job so well that he could find no fault. Also, I would often volunteer to stand guard unarmed at night in the darkness on this busy river with the crocodiles and hippos for company facing the enemy, <laughs> quote unquote, and I did many times. Finally, I convinced the sergeant major that I was no coward, that I was not shirking my duty, but that I simply had a conviction that was different to his. Believe it or not, he finally learned to respect my stand as I did his. It was my habit in those days, this is how I found out, to rise up an hour earlier than the army camp and go to a deserted guard post and commune with the infinite, with the creator. I spent 22 years on my knees, not missing one single day for an hour every day, often an hour and a half, two hours, communing with the infinite. One morning, I heard the leaves rustle outside the hide, as I say, where I was meditating in the desert. So I looked through the cracks to see the receding figure of none other than the regimental sergeant major as he was making his way down the hill. Incredible, I thought. Somehow he had been made aware of my habit of stealing away in the early hours of every morning, an hour before everyone else got up, and decided to check up on me to see what I was up to. <laughs> oh, I had such an irreverent laugh with the infinite. <laughs> Can you just imagine his disappointment at finding me on my knees? meditating instead of sending messages to the Soviets, <laughs> which were our enemies in those days, <laughs> via some antiquated telegraph system. Absolutely hilarious and side-splitting, my friends. <laughs> During those days, also what helped a lot, of course, was the, the support I received from my fellow soldiers that would come up to me, shake my hand warmly and encourage me to stand by my beliefs and not to give in. Don't give in, Gabby, so they used to call me. We're rooting for you. And this is a very helpful realization that although society d around us does all it can to dissuade us from being non-conformists, once they see that we've dug our heels in and we're not going to be budged, and we're not fakes. It's just a message that we're expressing from deep within the inner chambers, the secret chambers of our heart, from our DNA. They come out and openly support us, whereas before they secretly admired us. They wished they had the courage and the metal to take a stand for their precious beliefs and ideas, but so far they have not. But have you noticed what happens next? Our success is a big encouragement to them. They begin to become alive, to come to life. They, they begin to realize, hey, 
If she or he can do it, so can I. Yes, my friends, you listening to me right now. So can you. And so, we positively influence people all the time without even knowing it, without being aware of it. And don't you think that the infinite, the God, looks down at this lot and says, Yep, that's just as I planned it. As a heartwarming smile spreads over the celestial face. <laughs> <coughs> Often, Sergeant Major, my persecutor, would be serving food. And as I would pass by in the queue line in American, <laughs> he would say to me, Get lost. I don't serve fuckers like you. <laughs> Every day after that, my friends and strangers alike would bring me more food and water than I could possibly eat. One time, on a Sunday, while everyone was relaxing, I was ordered to take a shovel and dig a ditch all around the camp. I took the shovel off, uh, I mean I took the shovel, took off my shirt and started digging. The other soldiers watched me for about five minutes and then they lined up to take the shovel away from me and take turns of digging the trench for me, not allowing me to touch the shovel again. Yeah. We are bigger than the lives we live. We're not just flesh and blood. Something's going on here. You and I, when we take our stand, will find people like us who are willing to help us because the real, authentic us has emerged. Not a useless phony. And people like, love and respect the real McCoy, the authentic us, the authentic you, the authentic me, that the infinite created. No one, on the other hand, likes or respects a phony. If all of us shed our useless and phony masks that we walk around with, we'd all like, love and respect one another. Because, as the old Texan saying goes, God didn't make no junk. <laughs> Don't misunderstand, my friends, our purpose is not to compare miseries, but rather to share with one another the roads to healing that we have walked on. And to join together in any way we can to comfort other fellow sufferers and to see what we can do to put a stop to the conditions in the world which give rise to our suffering in the first place. Here then is the one of the biggest secrets to health, happiness, wealth and freedom. We have to align ourselves with the positive power of the infinite. It's a 24-7 job. If we let our guard down even for a few moments, we will pay for it in some way in order to remind us to get back to concordance and alignment with the infinite. We're all in a huge boat, my friends, on a journey together. How are we going to travel? Are we going to continue to bury our heads in the sand like the proverbial ostrich? Or are we going to do something about it? These questions open up nerve endings, my friends, which remain attached to us and left untreated. They hurt like hell. I know. Um, live in the real world too like you, not some Alice in Wonderland, Fairyland story, whatever that saying is. These questions have been or will be asked by all of us at some point in our lives. The best we can hope for is some understanding for what works and what does not work in our lives and maybe be content with that trusting the divine, the infinite, to provide for us the perfect thing at the perfect time. See, when you, we come, when you, we, me, when we come face to face with the atrocities mentioned above, we immediately are forced to search our soul. 
You ask a myriad questions, often getting very few answers, if any. Sometimes, though, a light so strong will shine through and give us a glimpse into our being, our authentic being. The light may stay, the light may go, it does not matter, really, because we never stand still, we're always moving, always gaining new insights and new understandings as the clock ticks on. This is my understanding up to this point. Tomorrow it may change. <laughs> of course. I do I know what the next five minutes will bring. Never mind tomorrow, next week, next year. This is how far my light has shone. And even then, I'm hampered by grammar and language and mere words to describe a lifetime of experiences that can never fully be shared by another human being. words, as Eckhart Tolle says, are just pointers to the truth. You can't verbalize the truth. If you can, then it's not the truth. You can only experience it. So even as I write and talk on radio, or whether like this with you, new insights and understanding are gained incessantly all the time. One of my most useful philosophies is to flee seriousness, to laugh in the face of disaster. This is a philosophy that has not only saved my life innumerable times, but much more importantly, has inestimably enriched my life. What is life? And why do we cling to it so? Who knows? I certainly don't. One thing I do know, and know that I know, I love interacting with my fellows, whether they be illiterate trackers leading me to a lion, or whether they be suave and sophisticated college professors. I love interacting with my fellows. I learn from them all. I enjoy them all. They, along with you and me, are our lives, along with the divine, the infinite, the God, the higher power of our understanding, whatever he, she, or it, or all three may be. <laughs> See, without interaction from our fellows, life would be drab and colorless, hardly worth living. On the other hand, our fellows, our fellow human beings, infuse our life with laughter with fun, with warmth, with excitement, with adventure, with wisdom, with knowledge, with tears of joy, with tears of sadness, with newness of life, with variety, with love, with hate, with comfort, with intrigue, with intensity, with life, my friends. Without each other, my friends, we have no life, only an inane existence lackluster and intensely dull. This is why I write and speak to commune with my fellows. And in and in that communion to live life to the full. This is a big truth, my friends. I write and I speak to commune with my fellow human beings. Because in that communion, I live life to the full. Good friend is dead now, vividly and rather poignantly reminded me of this eternal truth. He lived in a gorgeous city on a beautiful coast, had lots of money in the bank and was married to a gorgeous woman, had three delightful children and yet he confided to me that my emails were the thing he most looked forward to. I know it's hard to believe, but yes. What are all those things he had worth without someone or many someones to enjoy them with? So, my friends, I invite you to enjoy, therefore, this listening as you explore and share my life with me. And please write me or email me. 
my details will be on the description portion of this share your life with me if you feel like it it's all we have and ever will have between us this communion between us the sharing our life with each other it will enrich us as nothing else will I know I've experienced what I'm talking about and continue to do so until next time my friends this is Dr. Gabriel Edis. I enjoyed communing with you and hope to do so more and hope to hear from you as well go well my friends <laughs>